Hey everybody, I'm going to be doing the uh, OSPF and MPLS videos soon, but uh, before we do that, I know that I have jumped ahead in some of the videos with the CG net and things like that. Uh, I think that it's, uh, I think it's time to actually cover some basics. Um, I think that we need to actually, here's your goats by the way, here's your goats and yay goats, let's, let's get some raccoons in here. There we go. There, right there. We've got the raccoons, yay. We've got our goats and raccoons here, yay. So, uh, yeah, I figured let's cover the basics. I'm gonna show you guys how to basically configure a MicroTik uh, router. And we're just gonna do a very simple gateway configuration. This configuration will work if you're deploying it as a very simple front end for a small micro pop. Uh, and then from here, we should be able to move up to uh, connecting a couple of sites to it with OSPF. So here we go. I like this guy, he looks funny. All right, so I've got GNS3 up here. We need some appliances first. Uh, first of all, here we go. We're gonna, this is my connection into my network here so I can work on. It. And here is MicroTik router. I probably don't need all this up, so let me just, uh, I'm gonna do a half a screen. That way I can the MicroTik over here. There we go. Um, where? I lost all my shit. I'm losing my shit. Ha 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 ha. Where'd it go? There it is. Let's move you guys to the pool. Alright, so GNS3, if you're not aware, is a uh, nifty little uh, virtual lab for doing networking. Okay, so I've got this. I'm just gonna configure it quickly. And this isn't a GNS3 tutorial, so. I'll give it a name, I'm gonna give it five ports, there we go, taco go. And now I'm gonna connect it, so this will allow me to connect it into my network so that uh, I can access it. Now we're gonna turn it on. So by activating this bad boy, this should uh, allow me to get into this from uh, outside of DNS3 using my uh, my thing right here. Now for my other videos, you might have noticed that some things have changed. I've actually removed my uh, my CAPs uh, and I'm long-term testing those TP-Link uh, Deco M5s to see what I can well, the two that are remaining, because one of them is a complete brick. It was dead out of box, but we're going to see what happens here, so. Uh, let's see now. Oh, I think it's up. Where's MicroTik? There we go. So I'm going to connect to the MAC address on this. There we go. And we'll give it a second to connect, because the MicroTik's do something flaky like this for some reason when you first use them for the first time, and I think it's because of this. I'll show you. I might as well go full screen now. All right, so first of all, I'm gonna log into the terminal now, and I'm gonna agree to the terms and use it. All right, so let's let's first of all give this thing a name. The system identity. Where is it? System identity. Here it is. So this is our gateway zero. Okay, I've given it a name. Then the next thing that you should do is you should do your users. So get rid of the uh, the default accounts. I'm just gonna I'm not even gonna put a password in here for the purpose of what we're doing. But never leave the admin account on there because if you leave the admin account on there, that's gonna be one of the first thing that the uh, hackers go after. They look for default usernames. Okay, it makes it easier because once you have the actual default username, uh, you can run it by uh, any kind of a brute force uh, tool like Claymore or John the Ripper, and um, yeah, you'll be able to actually like just run a hash or run a bunch of random passwords against it so get rid of that and use your username okay so that's that part the next one i would like to do is i'd like to go into ip services and disable anything that we don't need we're going to need api at some point so what we'll do for api is i'm going to um i'm just going to give it a nonsense ip so that uh, nobody can access it and then when we're ready, we would put our billing systems IP in here, like so, right? Okay, so we've gotten rid of that. Now we need to go to Tools, Mac Server, and we want to make sure that the Mac Winbox server is uh, available on... Well, we don't want it available on all interfaces, so let me go to the interface list here now. So interface list, interface list, and this is where we will create three. You can use my example if you want. This is kind of an arbitrary thing. They're just lists. All right, and we'll go pub being our customer we can go cx land like so there we go so we've got those guys um now i can go mac winbox server and you'll see these lists in here but i want to make sure that i don't bork myself just yet so basically what i like to do is i'll make mac winbox uh, winbox server only available on core so make a note of that okay so i would hit that core if i do that now it's going to boot me off mac telnet server same thing core only, right? Because we don't want people to be able to gain access through layer two to these routers if they're on the same broadcast domain, okay? So let's uh, let's add a couple of interfaces uh, to this thing and then we'll do the rest of them. I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit, I know, but honestly, I can't really think. I'm kind of stressed, so. Uh, loopback. Loopback is something you need to add. On the loopback interface, disable the um, spanning tree because this is just an arbitrary anchor interface that's used for local communications and uh, identification of the router itself. It's a fixed interface that you'll apply an IP address to that uh, will not change or vary. It's going to be basically the mailbox for this uh, guy. And I don't, I mean literal, like sitting at the edge of the seat. This is my address. Okay, so now we need our management interface and we need a last mile interface. Ha! 
You've already seen me do this before. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, because on this guy here, we're gonna be using uh, ETH1 as our WAN port, so capital ETH1, WAN. I capitalize them and I do them like old Linux. So Ethernet 1, WAN, right? Anytime that I take an interface and I elevate it to have a purpose, I like to capitalize it so that I can look at it at a glance as, oh, that interface is important. And I like to label it too. So I'm gonna log into this router now and watch. If I go to interfaces and print, you'll see capital ETH1 against all the lowercase ones, okay? So let's throw the rest of those ports in it because for our purposes today, um, the rest of these ports are just gonna be going into the last mile. These are just ports that would go to feed customers. Pretty cool, eh? I'm just gonna stick port two on the management interface just for gigs. That way you've got uh, access to the local router, right? Okay. So now that we've got those guys in there, okay, I am going to go over to IP addresses and let's give it some IPs because this is critical. We're gonna go based on that uh, network map design that I showed you guys. So first IP that I'm gonna give this will be the loopback. 10.80.255.1, okay? We're gonna stick that on the loopback interface. Next one. 10.80.1.1 slash 24. That's gonna be our management interface. And I'm gonna put management on there. Under comment there, you see? Watch my actions. I'm gonna try not to move too fast. And I apologize if there's a lot of noise. Remember, I live in a shithole, okay? Um, rotor ID. Not really by choice. Okay, now for our last mile interface. So this will be 100.80.1.1 slash 24. Okay, we're gonna stick this on last mile. And whoops, let me put a comment on it. CX net. So we've got our basic IPs in place here, okay? So I'm gonna go put our IPs up here. Now we're gonna wanna create a DHCP server. Oh, but wait, I jumped a step. You wanna have a DNS on here. So let's uh, let's find out which DNS is closer. So I'm gonna try pinging uh, Cloudflare because that's what I love so much. It's 21 milliseconds to Cloudflare. This doesn't really matter, by the way. This is just a practice that I like to implement. All right, pinging 8.8.8.8 is literally half the time. So just for shits and gigs, I'm gonna use Google as the primary DNS and the secondary will be Cloudflare. The reason why I'm using two separate DNS hosts is in case one goes down, what if all of Google services went down because, you know, some evil entity hacked them and killed them or something. Allow remote requests, okay? That's important, otherwise it won't work. But now that we've done these basics here, uh, I really should implement, uh, let me bring this up. I really should implement a firewall on this thing. Now, the microticks typically come with the default firewall. Good. Uh, it's basic, basic. But I honestly strongly suggest that if you're gonna uh, be running a Wisp, um, put the basic fi uh, firewall in there, but check out Greg Sell Consulting. He's got a wicked um, uh, firewall, so like a border firewall script that he's generated on his website. And Josh Haven Potter also has his website and he's got some really cool blacklist um, rules that you implement. Together they make a very powerful firewall. Um, so the Greg Sell one has DDoS um, mitigation. I wanna say it works, because personally I've used his DDoS mitigation tactic enough times to know that it actually really does make an impact when you've got you know thousands, 20,000 IPs coming at you like with uh, ICMP traffic, okay? Um, then with Josh Haven's rules, it checks into DShield, Malcode, and um, DShield spam house. And it'll actually pull blacklisted IPs from those servers in whatever interval that you set, usually it's once a week, and it'll update the blacklist on your router. Um, it'll basically purge and re-update uh, the IPs within that blacklist so that anybody who's been naughty, their IPs are automatically banned from your equipment. All right, so I've created, this is basically a modified version of the default Microtech firewall. Now, you need to make sure when you're, when I use mine, as you can see, I'm using lists, I have to make sure that the interfaces are present before I can actually copy and paste this, which I did because these are the interfaces that I reference. Where's my interface lists? Here, right, like so. See, WAN, CX, LAN, core. And by the way, now that I've got these guys in place, see interface list, we know WAN is ETH1. We know that core is management. We also know that core is loopback. And we know that the customer is last mile, so CX land, like so, right? Let's roll out a firewall. Okay, I'm just gonna get rid of that. If you need clarification, I'll answer in the comments below on what I'm doing. I, I'm trying my best to try to portray this, but see how we've got no rules here? First rule that's most important before it goes on the internet is your firewall. So let's open the terminal, and I'm going to log in again, and I'm gonna paste. 
there we go hit enter for the last line and you can see that the rules are now all in place here now this one I like to turn off this is a default and by default it's actually set for forward and if you've got any customers with public IPs on your network it'll block the port forwards so you want to uh, if you're gonna have this implemented when it's set as an input rule it's basically when it hits this router but we're gonna disable that we don't necessarily want that one enabled but these ones here are important so 53 is DNS uh, these are your SNMP 161 162 22 is SSH and the rest are the Winbox API and the Winbox itself. You don't want to allow external access to your directly to your management interfaces. This is, it's no bueno, man. That's how you get hacked. And if you get hacked, chances are your router will become a zombie and it'll hack other routers. Um, not to mention the shit show that it will cause you. And don't worry, I will be doing a video on backups. Um, so now we need to make the internet flow for people that are connected to this, right? So let's uh, create a NAT rule here. So setting plus, by default says source NAT, we go to action and we want to masquerade, right? So there's our masquerade rule, yay. Uh, I should actually leave that up maybe. I can leave up the windows that I've been working with, right? Let's do this like so. Okay, so we've got this basic stuff in place now. These are just very, very simple things. Uh, we've already added our interfaces to the bridge. Uh, we've got all these basic things in place. We need a DHCP server like I was saying earlier. <coughs> IP, DHCP server. So I'm gonna hit, uh... there we go. Let me make sure my thing's muted. I'm gonna hit DHCP server here, DHCP setup, and there's a wizard that does this for you. So I'm gonna do management first. Need a. And you really should have the DNS settings in place before you do this. I want to make the DNS though, I want to make it the uh, uh, main router for anything that's on the management. So I'll go 10.80.255.1, like so. And this helps with redirects. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read label this to MGMT, like so. Make sure always broadcast is enabled, conflict detection, dual stacks for 6 so we don't need to worry about that. But now I'm going to go to IP pool. Okay. I can actually make this smaller, clean up some real estate. And I'm gonna label the IP pool here uh, appropriately, MGMT, like so, right? Now we're gonna do one for the last mile. And then I'm gonna show you something which you really need to check because sometimes the microticks misbehave. I'm gonna copy the gateway for the customers here, by the way, and I'm gonna paste that where the DNS rule goes, see? So that they get their DNS information from your cache on your microtick. Now that doesn't scale well. Once you get too big, that can cause your router to be overwhelmed and you should actually move to a dedicated DNS appliance. Um, and I do recommend appliance. Don't homebrew unless you really know what you're doing or you can look at hiring somebody who knows what they're doing, okay? So and trust me on that. You don't want people looking at hentai. Um, so we're gonna go CXNet, we're gonna label that. And you think I'm joking, but I honestly, I, I know a bit, okay? And I tried setting up my uh, go CXNet labeled. I tried setting up a DNS server using a bind, bind nine, and I installed libnids, I did kernel hardening, I did uh, TCP wrappers, I did all the stuff that was necessary, followed all the best practices. I believe it was in OpenBSD, and uh, after three weeks of running it and only having my home, um, our main office, and um, you know a couple of uh, employee locations using that DNS, everything was fine. I was about to implement it and tell all the customer traffic of the network to use our new DNS server. And by the way, it was not exposed to the outside world. It was natted and it actually hit the root DNS servers uh, with a proper certificate. Well, one day we went to go log in and uh, everything that we went to was hentai porn. It was all hentai and the most disgusting, degenerate type of porn I've ever seen in my life. Every single link you went to is all URL redirect. So I'm like, great, it finally happened. It got hacked. Decided to log into the DNS server and I could. SSH was, uh, somebody changed all the credentials they completely compromised it so I, I literally just wiped the instance it was gone so that's your cautionary tale there I hope that was funny too because I'm trying to be funny but I don't think I can be funny today I don't feel it all right um so we're moving through we've got our IP stuff we've got our bridge stuff we've got our pools we've got our DHCP server um this stuff is all almost done being programmed uh what have I missed we've got net IPs bridge firewall uh, we should do, uh, oh, let me just double check something here. I like using Roman, by the way, because it allows you access to all sorts of stuff on your uh, network. It's like a layer two uh, framework for your microtics to talk to each other. But the catch is though, I'm gonna add the WAN and I'm gonna forbid it, like so, because you do not want WAN uh, to have <laughs> Roman enabled on it. And I have seen way too many upstream providers uh, with you know Roman or uh, IP discovery enabled on there. And another thing is, it's just for simple purposes, watch this. You can customize your um, uh, you can customize your discovery system. What I like to do while I'm setting things up is just do 
exclude, so not WAN. So it's gonna allow me to discover on everything except for the WAN interface. And in turn, uh, it will not issue uh, any kind of link layer discovery out through the WAN interface, which is critical as well, because you don't want people discovering that you're there, you don't exist. Mind you, you're gonna say that I'm contradicting myself because if you look here, I'm allowing ICMP. Well, that's not a bad thing, and we can have that for our gateway router, and then we can uh, disable that once we have public IPs on here. So let's enable Roman now. Oh, one second, sorry. It gave me Roman inactive ID not determined. Let's just, uh, there, when we go like this. Why are you being weird? I think it's because it's a uh, an instance running on my hypervisor here. So there, you don't have to do that by the way. Usually Roman will generate its ID based on the MAC address of the device. So don't worry about that. So Roman's enabled and I will be doing a tutorial video on Roman as well. So all that stuff is now in place. And actually for tracking purposes, I should take Roman and put it over here. Remember this is a basic router configuration and I'm trying to keep it also low. Um, What's another thing I need to show you? Uh, logging. Uh, so what I like to do for my logging is if you don't have a logging server, do this. So we're gonna go under tools, or sorry, under system, logging. And I'm going to go to actions here and I'm going to click on disk. And I'm gonna allow it to do uh, 1500 entries, okay? And I'm gonna allow it to make 10 log files. Now the purpose of this uh, is just simply so that if your router power cycles, you have all your logs. Because if your router power cycles currently, I'll click on log and show you. And it says memory, when this thing reboots, all of that's gone. You don't want that, right? So now I'm gonna go to critical. I'm gonna change it to disk. I'm gonna change error to disk. Bloody fingers work or I'll cut you off, I swear to God. Uh, here we go, info, warning disk there we go so now all the logging is going to go to disk for us so that's another little thing that we need to have in place and now i should probably set up like prep the ospf we're not going to do it just yet we're just going to prep okay so now i'm going to bring up this window here and we don't have any point to point stuff happening right now right i'm going to do another video shortly about the ospf which all of you guys want to learn so first of all we need to add the ip addresses for the subnets that directly participate in ospf that are necessary for ospf to function and that's it don't put all all of your subnets in here. We're gonna take advantage of a couple of cool abilities that the OSPF instance itself supports. All right, so let me go up here and get the router ID. I'm gonna click on here. This is a slash 32, by the way. It's a OSolo IP address. I'm gonna stick this over here now so that the loopback interface becomes part of the OSPF. Next, I'm gonna go to instances here and I'm just going to put the name in here. Gateway okay, zero. And I'm gonna paste the loopback IP in here. Now, something which you should know is on every single one of your routers on your network, you may wanna have redistribute connected routes and static routes on here. So I'm gonna enable those. And on your gateway, always is type one. I will explain the OSPF in the next video that I do that that's about OSPF, okay? So we're gonna hit okay here. That's all in place. Now, if we go to the main uh, window for interfaces, I could double click on here. You see how it's DP for uh, dynamic, uh, passive. See, if I hover over dynamic. I'm gonna copy this actually. I'm gonna double click and go copy and now that generates a static entry and I'm gonna hit okay now I've got a fixed static interface in there that will not go away and as long as there is one interface operational within um, OSPF if anything happens at any other part of the um, OSPF uh, your convergence won't be lost but we'll go into that after okay so that's all prepped now too so just an overview we've got our IP addresses in place here we've got our public IP which we're getting DHCP right now our last mile IP address for the customers and our router ID which is the loopback IP IP to uh, identify the router and here's our management uh, IP and we've got our DCP servers in place yes we've got our DNS entries in place which I think I skipped over that in the DHCP server before you're done with it double check and make sure that these entries are populated because sometimes they won't populate themselves okay so we've got that uh, we've got our firewall filter rules we've got our NAT rule to make our, our router work our IP pools our logging we've restricted access to the system um feel like I'm forgetting some something important um later uh, i am not well that's most of the basics well and by the way for remote access we'll get into those in, in another video for remote access you're going to want to use a vpn to get into your router so that way if you're off of your network and you need to gain access to your uh network for management purposes you simply just have to start your vpn and call in don't open your service ports externally you do not want people to be able to hit your win box i don't care if you set up an acl or anything on the external interface if you don't have to have services uh connected directly to your uh, uh your services good set up vpns if there's something like a billing platform or um, some type of a um, management system or something that needs 
to talk to your router, then yes, your, really your only option is IPACL, okay? And that means access control list. So I think that's everything that uh, needs to be in there. Um, I'm trying to think if I forgot something, because I'm sure I fucking forgot something here. Oh yeah, well here's one thing by the way. Do a backup. I'm gonna do a backup and I'm gonna put uh, site name first. So taco goat um, GW0 dash and then my initials, Sarah Kerr, and then the date, which is uh, November 6, 620, like so. And I'm not gonna encrypt the first backup. I typically don't encrypt the first backup. And then we can just download that. Just download it, it's good. Okay, so yeah, essentially that is the bare minimum uh, programming for your router. We will go into more advanced uh, items sooner or later. If there's anything I missed in the video, please shout it out in the comments and I will copy and paste it into the description, but I'm pretty sure that's uh, the essentials that you need to get yourself going. I'm just, it's just nagging me that I think that I've forgotten something. I hate that. Actually, you know what? There is one thing that I could do to check. Watch this. I'm gonna terminal here. And I can make this a little bit bigger. Here we go. And I can do uh, a export. And this will show me the full configuration of the router. Okay, so we've got our bridges. We've got our interfaces. Let's see here. Uh, we've got our interface lists. Wire off, IP pool. Our basic routing. Interface uh, bridge port. Yep. Uh, IP neighbors. IP addresses. DHCP server. Uh, DNS. Firewall, NAT, and filter, service port. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's most of it. All right, so I hope just that you guys enjoyed today. Uh, it does take quite a bit to do these videos, so uh, feel free to uh, send me a tr contribution through PayPal or actually trying to set up a uh, rewards program on Patreon where when you're a Patreon, you actually get to see the videos before anyone else, which is uh, great because you'll also be able to directly talk to me and interact with me and uh, discuss things and whatnot. So, plus it helps me because, you know, it does cost a lot to make these videos. So, thank you everybody. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Like and subscribe below, leave your comments, keep it civil. Love you, catch you later.